I am Paul Evans, and I am the mess. Uh, on the other half of the mess moderator, Denise, who uh, you probably see send out email notifications and updates. Um, for all, everybody who's actually joined MESS, thank you very much for that. And this is officially the second meeting of the Media Entertainment and the Scientific Storage Group. So this is looking great. We are bigger than we were last time, so we're going to keep going on that trajectory. So tonight is going to be um, pretty focused on CEPH and distributed scalable file systems. I'm just going to put that kind of umbrella out there. Um, <clears throat> the problem with that statement is that Ceph is not actually a file system. And so the second half of the meetup is going to be uh, discussing how to define things. Um, can we get to a common lingo so that when we say words, they, we all sort of think the same way? I am confused, and I would like to come out of the evening with less confusion. I'm not looking for absolute clarity, but less confusion I'm good with. So, um, before we launch in, does anybody have any questions or comments so far about the evening? Like, where are the restrooms? Uh, <coughs> if, if I was, for example, Shanghai to drag along to the meeting, where do I find out more about this? Uh, so that would be very easily found at meetup.com slash mess dash LA. And in case, <laughs> like a reminder, we brought about 20 or 30 mouse pads. Um, I know that mouse pads are probably like so last century, but I still appreciate having a clean one every so often. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, just to answer the question about where the restrooms are, I believe they're down the hall here. Yeah. And I make it right. Yeah. And there's also one right there. Or there. <laughs> Don't tell people. There's a shower in there too, just in case. <laughs> that, one, that one doesn't scale horizontally, it's just the same. <laughs> Which is a good topic. Not a scale out restroom. Uh, other questions? All right, well then I'm going to go ahead and introduce TV, who is a, um, a coder. Just a plain, simple, <laughs> walks on water coder, from what I hear. Um, and so you're going to try and explain to us the concept called Ceph, which is, if you could turn your back real quick, the, the oh. future of storage. Oh. And, and as... Um, According to rumors I hear, the future is now, now, right? Yeah. Um, because Ceph goes into production or is already in production. It's in beta? Yep, it's in beta. Okay, so Ceph is running part of DreamHost. Mm -hmm. And a uh, cloud storage product that's based on it. It is currently in beta. We're hoping to go into a wider beta in a couple of weeks. And uh, uh, if you've got a business card or something, drop it with me, and I'll be happy to get you guys on the beta list. If you want to play with it later. It's an uh, S3 compatible storage platform. Excellent. So if TV, you're ready? Yep. I'm going to hand it over. All right. So before we get going, I wanted to get a little bit of a clue about who you guys are. So I'm going to throw out a couple of keywords and just tell me, does this sound familiar? High performance computing. Mm -hmm. A couple. Uh, I'm seeing a few nodes. I'm going to say five. Cloud. I'm going to say nine for that one, probably. Uh, virtual machines, as in not cloud, just virtual machines. That's probably even more than the cloud. OK, object storage. I'm seeing about five-ish. Um, how many of you are dealing with petabytes of data? Uh, let's say five. Uh, how many of you dealing, are dealing with 100 machines, not, not even necessarily storing anything, just machines, servers, old school servers count as well? Uh, call that a six. How many of you are dealing with 1,000 machines or more? That's a three or a four or somewhere in there. Okay, that gives me a nice bit of idea of where to go with this. So, okay, let's get rolling. So, delivering the future of storage, big words. That's okay, we scare them. Um, <laughs> the problem with the traditional way of doing storage is that you have these hardware appliances that you buy as a box, and that's it, that's what you get. So the first one you buy, you get a bunch of computers with a bunch of disks. They might not tell you that they're PCs, but these days they are PCs with disks. And 
and they give you a bunch of um, things that you, you don't really know what's inside the box, you just use it. And you pay, uh, pay 14 bazillion for it. Now, if you want to grow and you want to get your second petabyte, your choices are pretty limited. You're either buying a bigger box or another box. And that's another 14 bazillion. And you're still kind of locked with the same solution. What if it's not as good anymore? You can't really do things like swap out a computer and put in a bigger one. You can't upgrade the RAM on a proprietary box that is completely sealed from you. It just doesn't happen. Um, you also don't see what's going on inside. You can't do fancy tricks. You can't uh, take advantage of what you've learned along the years. You can't do anything yourself. You're limited by exactly what you bought originally five years ago. So this is all built on tiny little spinning rust. That breaks. It breaks in various ways. It breaks often. Uh, if you have about a million things, and uh, is that supposed to be eight times a million? Rust? No, it's just a million disks. OK, so let's say you have a million disks. But let's say uh, you have 55 failures a day. Now, that's, that's getting kind of there where you need to do something better. And it also means your replace rates are huge. If you stuck with the old hardware that you originally bought as a black box, you can't really upgrade to deal with the failures either. If you're uh, dealing with more off-the-shelf style things, you can build new and let the old stuff rot. And once you have a whole rack that is, let's say, 70% failed, you just take down the whole rack, replace it with new stuff. So you, you just don't have the flexibility. So that's kind of where Seth comes into the picture. We wanted to build something that is honestly better. By any standard you pick, we wanted to build something that is better. And we're doing it as an open source project because we want to actually literally change the world. And that's why we keep saying the future of storage. That's why we think it's a big thing. Even if Seth itself fails, even if Ink Tank fails as a company, I do believe we have kickstarted something big. So Seth is a bunch of different things, and this is kind of what Paul was talking about earlier. This is the file system part. Ooh, OK. <laughs> so it's not that much. There's a whole lot of other things. The file system part is the cherry on top. So we're going to talk about all the other things first before we get there. Underneath everything, there's Raiders, which is a reliable, autonomous, distributed object store. So what that means is you have a bunch of disks. You have just traditional file systems on top of that. And you have a daemon process that serves content of the disk, reads and writes. And the things that are stored on the disk are objects, not books. So they, for example, are uh, of different lengths. They can have key value storage in them also. It's not a dumb system. There's, there's all kinds of smarts in there. You can actually have operations that you can call on the data. Uh, and you're looking at this huge cluster that has a lot of servers running OSDs, and there's a couple of special machines that you kind of spread out over your architecture so that they don't fail at the same time. They, for example, do not have the same cooling, the same power, the same networking. They're spread over the network. And these are the monitors, which kind of keep track of what's going what's going on. And you access this cluster as a whole. Um, the monitors maintain a cluster map. Who belongs to the cluster? What's going on? They provide uh, decision-making services. They do not participate in the actual input-output. They do not deal with the data. The OSDs are the storage. And if you want replication, you have at least three in a cluster. That's a kind of boring cluster set. We usually deal with hundreds. Um, we kind of usually say one per disk, except if you have a huge machine that takes 100 disks, then that might not be a good idea. So 10 to 20 OSDs per physical machine might be the way to go. Right now, we're getting best numbers out of something like six, but that's just a question of where the tuning is right now. So we're aiming at uh, the typical off-the-shelf server being, let's say, eight to 12 disks. That's kind of a common hardware scenario. We think, uh, think that that amount of OSDs per server is the right amount. TV? Yeah? So is an OSD a service, a core, or a processor, or a box? 
An OSD is a process running on a Linux server. Yeah. yeah. Is it is each OSD allocated to a specific disk, or do they kind of just commingle and? Uh, each one is kind of defined by some amount of storage. You point it to a subdirectory. Usually, okay. that subdirectory is a whole separate file system. Okay. Is it collecting metadata, pointing information to the disk, or is the um, monitor doing that? It depends on what you mean by metadata. We'll get to that. Okay, so the next thing we talk about is libraries, which is just a client-side library that you use to talk the protocol to understand the cluster. And once you use it, you'll get put operations, all that stuff talks natively to the whole cluster. Yeah? You go back. <laughs> <laughs> no. One more. So an OSD, one per disk. When you say disk, are you talking about that file system? Yes. Or a chunk of the file system? Um, usually, we go with a JBOD style setup, where you have a physical disk has a file system on top of it, and OSD running on it. Oh. And usually, there's another disk that is the journal for that OSD, and that's kind of what you have for an OSD. Now, if you have lots of disks per server, then you want to bundle them into, a, for example, a RAID 6 set, and then run an OSD on top of that. But usually, you give an OSD uh, one file system and a journal. Libraries. Um, it is a uh, C++ library that does the actual connection, talking to the cluster, and it understands the, the nature of the cluster. It is able to talk to all the nodes in the cluster. So there is no sort of proxy process to go through. It is natively talking to all the machines in the cluster. Uh, Raiders Gateway is a little bit more of a user-friendly approach to using the object store. So it is lay it on top of libraries and provides kind of its own abstractions, buckets, user accounts, access control lists. None of this exists in the low-level system of libraries and the Raiders protocol. Uh, it is provided by the RESTful gateway. And uh, the APIs that you use are HTTP, they're RESTful, they look like Amazon S3, they look like Swift. So you can often take a client and uh, take a client that was built to work in this Amazon S3 and use it against Raiders Gateway. So how would that fit in OpenStack? Um, if you wanted to replace Swift with a Raiders Gateway installation, you could. Um, we'll come back to that also. Okay, um, so it, it really is this particular style of accessing your data that is really sort of um, um, makes sense to a web developer. And it is that is the audience the rest gateway, uh, the register gateway is built for. Um, so if you have people working with, say, PHP, Ruby, or Rails, this is what they understand well. So it kind of serves that audience. So the next thing is RBD. Uh, RBD the R comes from Kratos, BD block devices. So you have some sort of a virtualization container, for example, KVM, Zen. Uh, and that uses libRBD, which uses libRaiders, which talks to the cluster and actually stores things in objects. And your disk that the virtual machine thinks is real, you can make it show up as SCSI if you want, and it completely fools the system into believing this is an actual, actual physical disk. It is divided into chunks. The default size of the chunk is 4 megabytes, but that is configurable. So, but the point is that each one of these chunks is stored in a separate object in a separate location all over the cluster. So now imagine that you have a highly threaded process running on the virtual machine or just lots of processes accessing the disk at the same time. The reads and writes are going to be spread all over the cluster, which is kind of a nice feature to have. Uh, so you're not really bottlenecked by uh, seek overheads in that sense that your reads come from 200 different spindles easily. So where does the virtualization container exist? On a gateway? No, uh, so, so basically the, the libRBD stuff ties directly into your virtualization platform. Uh, if you're running if you're running like KVM, it links directly to libRBD. Uh, same thing with Zen. So it runs straight out of the hypervisor. Okay. How, how does that architecture handle caching? Uh, we have a cache in here. 
and uh, there's different ways of running it. You can have write back cache, you can have write through caches, you can con configure the size of the cache. All of that is configurable. Wouldn't, um, you, wouldn't you also have potential for cache with the OSP? Uh, yes, but that doesn't, there's nothing special about RPD at that point. Okay. It's just objects. And yes, they, they are cached in memory if there's free memory. The, the other thing is, because you're you're running a VM, typically your operating system has caching in it as well. So you get advantage of that because because the RBD device looks like a, for example, a SCSI disk to your, uh, your VM. So you're going to have a cache inside the virtual machine also. Yeah. Now it might not have as much memory, but yeah. and these boxes will use any free memory as a cache, just by the nature of running Linux. That's it. Um, so on the on the physical drive level, if you're running dissimilar drives, like say you have older you have an older chunk that's running one you know that are running hundred gig drives and newer chunk that are running one terabyte drives, mm -hmm. does it recognize that there's a performance difference in some drives? Um Ceph in itself doesn't try to do anything about that by itself. What we do is enable you to describe the shape of your data center. I have this data center that has these three rooms. Each one of them has these rows, these racks, these servers, these disks. And you can describe that as in you can put your slow disks into a different hierarchy from the fast disk. You can control so you can where you place your data. So you yeah. can effectively create like a tier two environment or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. for example, you can say that each one of your virtual machines gets an OS disk and a data disk. And the, those are stored in different hardware. Okay. You can do things like that easily. Does it have the concept of Understanding the data that's in the system, for example, where, where would deduplication be implemented? Would that be done at the application layer, or? Um, we're not actually doing any deduplication, so it wouldn't. <laughs> okay. uh, we can talk about that later, but I kind of want to keep rolling forward, so we can come back to that as a uh, part of the conversation. Side question, not to get you too distracted, <laughs> but if, they want, if somebody wanted to do dedu, does ButterFM support dedu? Within one file system, but now you're looking at a sliver of one of these servers. So that's not really all that beneficial. Uh, we do uh, the, the sort of simple version of DDoP where if you do copy and write cloning, it does not get uh, copied until you write to that space. So in that sense, there is duplicate avoidance, but there is no DDoP. Now, once again, if, you, if you're building on top of the object store yourself, you can do content address storage, and that is your DDoP mechanism, for example. Um, so uh, there was a question about OpenStack. So in this case, that would be Nova. Nova volume, something like that, would be dealing with uh, talking, making this virtual disk actually be stored on this network service that is provided by the cluster. And you could have uh, their uh, glance, which is the storage of the sort of image templates that virtual machines are created from, you could have that be backed by Ceph, and you could have uh, the Nova be backed by Ceph. And in the future, next version of OpenStack, we're working on uh, copy and write for that, so you can create virtual machines quickly. And I'll come back to that, but before that, I want to talk about live migration. So now that your storage for the virtual machine isn't on this physical hypervisor machine, that server, it is networked. Now you can move that virtual machine around and it just keeps going because it can access the same underlying storage from its new location. And this is not tied to like a SAN or a fiber channel or anything. This can go across data centers if you want. As long as you have good TCPIV connectivity, it works. And we're Working on more features like that, for example, slowly migrating it to the correct data center, that sort of stuff is doable. Um, but that is one of the things that you kind of want to play with because it's hard to believe until you see it. You leave an animation running on one screen and you migrate the machine and it pops up on your another screen. And that's kind of neat. I don't know about you, but I didn't believe that it works until it worked. <laughs> Okay, uh, an alternative to using virtual machines is using RBD directly from any Linux uh, server. So even if you're not playing with virtualization, you can use RBD as just a big disk. What if you want a 10 terabyte disk? Thin provisioned instantly, right there, available for use. You just make a fast mount it, and that's it. So we can do that with a kernel module. 
And uh, the kernel module is part of the mainline kernel. So the last part is the set file system. And the thing to know about it is that we store metadata separately from data. So directories, users, owners of files, access control, that sort of stuff is metadata, data is data. And the metadata resides on metadata servers, which, once again, it is just a process. You could run it on the same physical server as something else, but we like to think of it as having its own uh, needs. <coughs> For example, metadata servers really want to have a lot of memory available for free. So it's kind of useful to dedicate a machine to them. So it provides the file system part. And this is what you do when you want actually to use a file system and not objects or block storage. Um, now, the flip side of that is, if you don't want the file system, you just want virtual machine storage, you don't need to run any metadata service. So it is modular in that sense. It is nicely layered on top of the object store. What makes that unique is an algorithm called Crush, where if you don't know where the data is, you can't access it. The usual way of knowing where something is is having a lookup table and needing to play with that constantly. Every time you need to read something, you need to look up where it is. Every time you store something, you need to write where it was. Or doing something like sharding, where the problem is, what if n is a really popular first character? So you end up needing to rebalance, and that, then that essentially becomes a lookup table. Uh, instead, what we do is we hash the object name into one of these containers. I'll call them buckets if S3 didn't exist. <laughs> and each one of these is programmatically placed somewhere in the cluster by a deterministic algorithm that takes the cluster shape and health into account. And all of these live in different locations. Now what happens if one of the machines goes down? We were supposed to have two copies of the red thing and two copies of the yellow thing, but we lost one copy. So now we just find a new location based on the crush algorithm and copy the data over there. And we're good. And the client, as it knows about this updated uh, state of the cluster, the new health information, it automatically knows where to go for the data. There is no lookup table. There is just cluster health, cluster shape, and that's it. So the client is constantly looking at cluster health and knows when Drive uh, the information is spread with a gossip protocol. So if the client has an older version of the data, it is given an incremental update. Now, this is what's going on right now. And uh, the way it is actually detected is also a gossip protocol. So the nodes detect each other's failures, and then the information kind of bubbles out of the cluster. But would the client know that something has failed before it has to seek to look for that data? Often, yes. Uh, I like to keep saying that Seth has no single point of failure. Yeah, Seth has no single point of failure. Mm -hmm. Seth has no bottlenecks in the design. There are some in the implementation still, but they're kind of on their way out. And that also means that we don't do something like run a monitor node that goes through all the servers every now and then. No, it's, it's distributed. The job belongs to the cluster. Okay, uh, we talked about, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, how do you spin up a thousand VMs quickly? You have your base image, and you have thing and provision copies, and you only need to store the rights to those. Now, this is what we're doing with OpenStack. Next version of OpenStack, we will have this going, and it will be really nice, and you will actually be able to spin up VMs without downloading gigabytes of data for no gain. Is that wholesome? Yes. 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 There are too many things that have an alphabetical release schedule for me to keep track of all of them, <laughs> including us. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm kind of running out of time. Uh, so I want to talk about this guy. So we have metadata servers. And if you run three of them, but you have one file system tree, what happens? Well, you need to divide the work somehow. So what we do is we say the gray guy gets all of the tree to begin with. When you add the uh, 
Cyan. I'm too male to know the names of these colors. Um, when you add this guy, he gets a part of the tree. You add another one, he gets some part of the tree. You add another one, he gets some part of the tree. And these are not just initial addition time operations, it's also dynamically, as there's load, as there's a lot of files in some part, it gets busy, it gets uh, hot, it gets spread out. So what we do is essentially you want to open a file that is slash home slash cv slash something something something. We walk the path and find what metadata server is in charge of that file. And this information gets cached by the client, so you don't normally need to do that walk every time. So I talked a lot about Seth. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah, this is, you know, what happens when a metadata server dies? Ah, how do you recover? All of this, remember that they live in a cluster. Let's use that function. These guys live in a cluster. So they don't actually use local storage for anything. They actually put all of their stuff as objects in the uh, object uh, store. So they, they use the Liberator's uh, client, uh, client library, and for example, each directory is an object. Uh, each, uh, they also have a journal of ongoing operations to make them more efficient, and they write that out to objects also. So when this guy dies, all you need to have is a spare somewhere that pops up and starts doing operations, and it reads the journal of the previous guy from the objects that it stored store it into, and it has the sort of the permanent state stored in objects also. So dying and starting somewhere else is no problem at all. And once again, no single point of failure, no bottlenecks, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah? If you have your data, multiple copies of the data, is there load balancing between nodes if it knows that there's two, two identical copies? Um, first of all, there's load balancing on the level of if one node gets too busy, its load gets spread out. The, the but for the instantaneous process. moment, for the instantaneous moment of having multiple replicas, normally we read from the primary. That is that is the normal state of operations. If you're <laughs> in the HPC world, uh, for, or running Hadoop or something, you can set a flag in your file open uh, that says, I'm okay with getting uh, information from a replica. And then that gives you exactly that. What type of internal latency can the cluster tolerate? You're talking about being able to multi uh, migrate processes between data centers. Yeah. Are you talking like you know metro Ethernet? So, or? Um, let me relay a conversation <laughs> without naming names. <laughs> <laughs> um, we started this design was meant to be within one data center, and I sat down with a large ISP. And I told them this. I explained the problems. And then they told me the number of uh, data centers, the interconnects they have, and the SLAs they have on latency. And I said, you're OK using it at multiple data centers. So it really is a question of how far apart are your data centers? How good are your links? Um, any latency uh, that is between, say you have uh, replication size 3, so each one of your writes goes to three servers in the cluster. Let's say your cluster is spread over two data centers. Now, every write goes to three nodes. If one of those nodes is in the other data center, and it takes one second for it to respond, the client write is not acknowledged fully until one second has passed. So essentially, the latency is seen by the client. And as long as you're willing to understand this kind of what the design actually implies. It is a strict uh, coherency, strict integrity uh, design. So if you have latency between your data centers, that might be bad. Now, what you can do is you can do things with the hierarchical shape of your uh, data centers. So you can say, uh, this pool of storage is in data center A, and this data pool of storage is in data center B. And you can create an RPD image and explicitly place it in data center B. And you can do a copy or write clone of it to data center A, which means your writes go to the local data center, but your reads might need to be served from the other one. And then you can slowly migrate it over. So th there's things you can play with, but you need to understand the fundamentals there, that we're not hiding the latency, because 
this is not an eventual consistency system. There is no way to hide the latency. The, the other thing to note is networking is extremely important inside of SAP. Um, having low speed links in your cluster is bad. Um, so if you have, like, in, in the design that we're currently building, uh, we have 10 gigabits coming out of every single machine that aggregates up to a 40 gigabit ag, and then those partially mesh to each other. Um, if you bring in a integrated center link that's only 10 gigabits, you're going to start seeing latency issues because the network matters. So I've been talking about Seth. I do want to say something about Ink Tank. So Seth is an open source project. If we're all unemployed tomorrow, Seth is still there. If you want to buy services from somebody else, Seth is still there. So we're kind of leaving that sort of up. Remember me starting this talk by talking about proprietary solutions. We're essentially trying to be as non-proprietary as we can with Seth itself. Now, Ink Tank is the thing that actually pays our salaries. And there's a difference. Ink Tank is putting a lot of effort on Seth. Ink Tank wants to build a business supporting Seth, training things about Seth. We want to be a good uh, place to come to for questions. We don't consider uh, ourselves to be owning Seth by any means. Not even literally, if you look at the corporate web. So what does Ink Tank want to do? We want to make Seth be awesome, but we want to do it with you. So try it out. Tell us what you think. Ask if you need help. The mailing list tries to be as helpful as, we, as it can. We have an IC channel that has all the developers right there available to you completely sort of unofficially in the spirit of the open source project. If you're a company, you might want to actually try it out. You might want to figure out if you want to join the revolution and actually do work based on this. We're absolutely interested in having partners that would do, for example, NFS or such gateways, proxies, that sort of stuff. Integration with the other world that is unable to talk the set protocols. Um, I don't have a nice ending slide because I stole these slides from that man over there. <laughs> Thank you very much for the slides. They're good. <laughs> um, any questions? Well, okay, so I'll come up with a question. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Um, if you were to use the block service, so uh, I guess first question is reality based. Um, which of the services that you talked about, Object Store, RBD, and file system, are ready to do real work today? I will answer you with this picture. Rados is underneath everything. Lib Rados is used by a lot of things. I think this should actually be like there. <laughs> um, so basically, we are building a pyramid that has three tips or four tips. It's not a traditional 3D pyramid. It is a 4D pyramid that has multiple <laughs> uh, apexes. But this stuff that is doing the core of the object store has to be really robust. That is what we're putting on a lot of effort. That is what we're doing all kinds of stress testing. That is what we're doing for performance tuning. That This part is getting a lot of love. Now, Raiders Gateway is what was bought by our first customer, DreamHost. So it is getting a lot of love yeah. because it is the first thing we actually sold. The so Raiders Gateway is the object service. All we're doing is providing hardware bandwidth and load balancers. Other than that, everything underneath our object service is set. Okay. Which we consider you know, succeeding in our actual first sale essential for the business. So Raiders Gateway is getting a lot of love. RPD, the Raiders Block device, is a thin layer. It is simple. It is mostly relying completely on the object store. There aren't many features on top as such, because it is just providing object store by means of, uh, sorry, providing block storage by means of object storage. It's, it's, there's not much of an impedance mismatch there. Uh, the other thing about this is, Cloud is kind of big. 
So <laughs> you can kind of imagine that we want to be involved in all that. OpenStack, all of that stuff. RPD is getting a lot of love. Which kind of leaves me with the, the bastard of the family. Zephyrfest. <laughs> Zephyrfest, the distributed file system, is the original goal of this project. Yet it is the one thing that is the hardest to build. We need to get everything ready before the final piece. So right now, the status of Zephyrfest, the distributed file system, is that you do not want to use it in production. You want to test it. You want to experiment. You want to prototype. You want to understand what's happening. But to put a production service on it at this point, you're unlikely to lose data, but you will experience some downtime just because of the way things are. And it's also living at a stage where running multiple active metadata servers is absolutely not recommended. We can trigger problems doing that, which means there are problems left. Usually around this area, we can't trigger the problems anymore. This, this is all. Like, we need wider exposure to have any bugs. With this guy, we can still trigger them ourselves. But if you run a single metadata server, which limits the amount of operations you can do, it's, it's pretty good. There are people running it in production. Yes. Very adventurous people. <laughs> there, have, there have been people running RBD in production for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. There are people running ButterFS in production. <laughs> yeah. They're also experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Uh, and if I may ask, so what percentage of, of new people that are looking to build sort of next generation applications or infrastructures on top of this are going the way of directly talking to Libredos versus the gateway? Uh, that kind of depends on what you're building. If, if you were building, so one of the use cases I use because we're in LA, and this actually is mess media. So if you are building a digital asset library of some sort, where you are looking for object storage, and you have people who understand storage already, they're not just web developers, they actually understand storage, Liberators gives you a lot more. It is a more low-level interface, which means you end up doing a little bit more of the legwork, but you also have more flexibility. Redis Gateway is a higher level interface, but you're essentially going through these gateway boxes, you're managing these gateway boxes, and you're also stuck with the S3 API. Right. And you incur a lot of overhead with HTTP. Yeah. A real lot of overhead. <laughs> yeah. I would not want to, for example, implement RBD on top of Redis Gateway, <laughs> whereas RBD on top of Lib Raiders, no problem whatsoever. Does that kind of it helps. Yeah. The, the other thing I would, I would point out is, uh, depending on what your application is, uh, the thing that's kind of cool about Ceph is that it is entirely in user space. Uh, you don't have to use any kernel modules at all in order to make all of your Ceph applications work. Now, a lot of people focused on performance would not necessarily associate cool and user space. Right. So uh, the basic idea is uh, you don't have to you don't have to patch kernels and the performance like if you were to bring like the the problem is you have to bring the entire OSD into the kernel and that doesn't make a whole lot of sense um, the OSD is a good consumer of the kernel it is well optimized um, it is doing all the right things in sir in, in terms of multi-threading and using epoll and fun stuff like that um, to ensure that it is performant but you, it also means that when you're writing applications, you don't have to go put a wedge in the kernel to make it work. You can just link in the library and go. For example, the, uh, the integration with KVM, uh, KVM is actually a wrapper on top of QMU. So how the RBD integration works is QMU links to the lib RBD library, and all of that communication happens in user space, which is kind of awesome because you don't have to change your kernel, you don't have to do anything special, and if you want to put in a performance optimized kernel for your particular hardware, you don't have to worry about patch conflicts. Okay, you convinced me that the words belong together then. <laughs> so I, I have another teaser, which is more a uh, taste of what's coming up. We're not ready to talk about the file system that much yet, honestly, uh, but one of the interesting things <coughs> is Hadoop has a pluggable file system implementation that they do internally as a Java server, Java client, so on. 
but you can actually have, um, there's a library that implements the client side of this guy, libcfs. You can actually have a Hadoop HDFS client, it's not HDFS at that point, it's a Hadoop, a Hadoop file system plugin that talks the set file system protocol without involving a kernel level mount, without involving a kernel level set.ko or whatever. It is completely user space, which allows it to do things in a sort of more restricted environments because now it's just a library and a bit of Java code. Uh, it's also really nice because you literally don't need the mount on all of your machines. You can just do it dynamically as you need. You, you initialize the library, you open a connection, you go. So is that using Libretos? Uh, it, it is using a library that would be about here called libcfs. It's the client side of the distributed file system is available as a library. And libcfs also consumes libretos. Yeah, it's on top of that, yes. So that's like a subset of cfs? Yes, there's, there's a couple of different. So you can, you can uh, this guy you can use the libcfs as a client and program your own. You can use the kernel module, which is set.ko, and mount it as a typical Linux file system, or you can use a fuse daemon, which runs in user space, but it shows up as a proper system mount. So, all right, you brought up Hadoop. Is there any way to maintain locality so Hadoop is able to query locally? Yes. So the way Hadoop does it is it points at a file and asks what blocks are in this file and where do they reside. And we just run the crash algorithm and there's your answer. Okay. That's essentially what Hadoop does. It just it, it has a lookup table. HDFS has a lookup table to have that same information available. But it essentially asks for each data block, where is this? And based on that, it schedules the job to run close to that location. I'm not a Hadoop guy, but I find it interesting. <laughs> um, other questions besides me just standing up here? Yep. Does uh, CephFS have uh, Apple support? performs well, behaves the right way, has not even excess attributes these days. We can deal without those even, at least somewhat. So like essentially, just about any file system should work. Now the next question is, does it perform well? You will see. Um, as an example, there's a lot of interest in getting ZFS going. And I think that's what you were getting at. Uh, because what else is out there? JFS, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so essentially that's a question of put it together and see whether it works. If it does, does it perform well? If it does, hooray. Uh, most of the time when we have problems with file systems, it is because we are doing things that are slightly different from a typical load. So set the, the OSD part, it does not behave like a database. It does not behave like a mail server. It does not behave like a web server. So we're exposing a different workload to file systems. Sometimes that results in crashes, sometimes that results in weird behavior, and sometimes that results in horrible, horrible slowness. 
but usually we can write a little bit of a uh, independent program that is not part of Ceph at all that shows how slow the file system is, and then the upstream author of the file system goes, oops, sorry, and fixes it. At least we hope. It's worked so far pretty well. We have found kernel crashing bugs in just about all the file systems, that we can make them all go slow. Yep. Which is best? <sighs> That's a hard question. Depends. <laughs> it really um, depends on your workload. They, they behave differently. Um, a simple summary might be that ButterFS starts out fast, but degrades, gets slower, and sometimes disappears in a puff of smoke. <laughs> <laughs> XFS starts slower than ButterFS, degrades a little, but not as much. And X4 is a little bit of a wild card right now. It might perform good, it might perform bad. And then on top of this, you pile about five to 10 tunables for every file system that change the behavior in some way. And now you have different workloads on top of that. Are you read heavy, are you write heavy? So it's a complex picture. There is no one clear single winner. However, currently we do recommend access. For the future, we hope that ButterFS will be good. Does that ask the question? Mm -hmm. So if one was going to tickle their fancy around ZFS, are you talking about the ZFS port to Linux or something else? Um, Ceph code is kind of tied to Linux pretty strongly. There's, there's been BSD ports, but... The server side, you could, you could pretty easily port it. I'm more worried about things like we play tricks with the syscalls to make it fast, like SyncFS, that sort of stuff. Is that all going to exist? That would all be different for DFS, right? Exactly. Like you're so, so, so it's probably easy to get set working. Right. To get it going as fast might be a challenge. And honestly, we do all the work on Linux. So, uh, <laughs> there, there is a, a Linux uh, ZFS port that's actually sponsored by Lord Livermore. Um, it's supposedly fairly performant. The biggest problem is it's never going to make it in the mainline kernel because <coughs> ZFS's licensing restrictions, it's CDDL. Um, but I actually uh, know the guy who works on that project, and they're specifically doing it because they're getting better performance on Linux than they were on Solaris. Uh, and the hardware is cheaper, and they don't have to deal with Oracle. Um, <laughs> so it's one of those things where. Totally. Yeah, the, 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 the tricky part for, for Inktank and for the Ceph developers, though, is that because it is not in the kernel, it makes it that much harder to work with. It, it increases the, the problem size of um, which version, right, on which version on, on which kernel, on which flavor of the kernel, on, you know, it, it gets complicated. And um, with, with things like um, running on top of Ubuntu, we can say, you want support for the base operating system, go talk to Canonical. Right. So with ZFS, there's no Linux distribution supporting that combination. So you kind of, it's, it's a more of a do-it-yourself solution. Yeah. Now, if that is what you want, then that is what you want. If you want to become that person to sell that support, hey, go for it. <laughs> I, I think I'll wait and see what Intel does with it. Um, the, uh, the one thing I wanted to mention is, because we have replication in the cluster, you can play with the file systems on individual OSDs a lot more. So usually what happens if you put ButterFS on one-third, XFS on one-third, and X4 on one-third of your OSDs, is that every now and then some node gets really, really slow and gets kicked out of the cluster. You go in, you whack the file system, from scratch, it needs to copy its data back in, and you're back in business. So it's as if your disks failed more often. <laughs> That's literally what it is. Replication saves the day. Your, your performance does suffer a little bit because you're basically taking lowest common denominator at that point. Yes, once again, we're not hiding the latency. Right. So if you have some of your OSDs are slower and the replica goes on one of them, well, that's might be a problem. Yeah. Now, once again, what you can do is you can just uh, define pools where one of your pools is on X4, one of them is on ButterFS, one of them is on uh, XFS. Now, within one pool, you should get sort of similar performance, except that that doesn't really work that way. The, Performances of the individual file systems seem to seem to kind of go down sort of randomly. 
there's probably something that triggers it, something like it gets too fragmented to behave well and then it starts getting slow. So it depends on the workload that the individual OSD is receiving. So they don't all slow down at the same rate. Also, IO schedulers and all sorts of other fun stuff. Most distributions ship with the CFQ scheduler, which is actually really bad for this kind of workload. Which is the right one? We've been going with no-op for the time being. Especially if you have SSDs, no-op is the thing to go. Yeah. But no even on spinning, rest, uh, spinning rustic, performs surprisingly well. And we're explicitly spinning rustic. Uh, that also depends on what hardware you're running now. Once again, if you have a battery packed, uh, battery backed uh, bright cache on your whatever SCSI controller it is. Now, having no of means you're giving all your writes into that uh, uh, cache as fast as possible and then letting the hardware sort out in which order to write it down the disk, which may give the hardware hints on how to do it better. So it kind of all depends. There's a lot of tunables. And on your spinning rust for occasional storage, do you do that battery back cache thing? We do. We're using uh, uh, hardware from a vendor whose name rhymes with hell. Um, and all of their rate controllers have uh, battery backed uh, NVRAM on them. So that's what we're currently doing. And you see that performance boost by having that there, or can you not quite tell? You can't quite tell because they all have it. Um, there's like no way to turn it off. Although we, we did at one point, we tried doing some trickery with the RAID controller and that actually made performance worse. Um, sticking with just flat one, one RAID volume, because unfortunately these RAID controllers don't allow you to do JBOD, one RAID volume per disk, um, right back, adaptive read ahead, uh, direct access, uh, direct disk, so turning off the disk caching, uh, seems to yield pretty good performance. Are you using XFS? XFS? We are using XFS. Yes. So do you, sub, do you support pen provisioning? Yes. So are there specific guidelines around that? Um, it don't just works. Okay. Yeah, don't run the space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, everything inside of Ceph by default is pen provisioned. Okay. So objects don't exist until you've written to pen. So if an RBD image is chunked into individual objects and you haven't written to that offset of the block device yet, it's not stored anywhere yet. Uh, similarly, files are actually striped over multiple objects. If you haven't written to some offset of the file, there is no storage associated with it yet. Why well, make have one one? Is there a maximum over subscription rate you can accomplish or is just just keep going until you run out of space? Yes, you keep going, you keep Stop going. Stop before you run out of yeah. 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 Uh, the other thing that's kind of cool is with the virtualization stuff, if you're running a modern kernel that supports uh, trim and does block reclamation uh, inside of the file system, so basically all the all the kernels newer than 2635, I think, most of the file systems do it, the big ones at least like X4 and XFS and things like that. Um, Ceph will free those blocks when they're not in use on the back end as well, which is kind of cool. Um, so you're, you're continuing to get pen provisioning even while you're using the file system at that point. It's not like um, some other file system disk formats would start thin and eventually become very thick. Uh, it will continue to, it'll basically stay the same size as your active data set outside of the, on the, uh, the file system, uh, instead of growing until it reaches the full size of your allocation and then just overwriting. How does CFS, CFFS age in terms of fragmentation? Um, since it's object storage, there is no such thing as fragmentation. I mean, there's fragmentation of the underlying storage mechanisms, mm -hmm. but you plug in a new machine and things get rebalanced and that shuffled it out already. So if, if you're changing the size, the rebalancing will, will help with that? Even, even, even machines going down and coming back up, if, if they go out of the cluster, that's rebalancing. So as long as the data moves around, it's not defragmented just by that fact that it is moved around. And what and do you have reliability in your uh, cluster? So, so you don't have nodes disappear. Um, are you saying that there exists a system <laughs> where nodes <laughs> don't disappear? <laughs> no, re relatively. Okay, if the nodes don't disappear, the network will. Yeah. <laughs> now, once again, uh, this is on top of Linux file systems. Linux file systems are not really subject to fragmentation issues, apart from virus for now. 
like Explore XFS, they just don't solve that problem that badly. So not a huge issue. Um, and uh, essentially, if it was an issue, it would be an issue on the individual file systems, and then you would run a local defragmentation operation if you really cared or something. It's, it doesn't affect set the whole. Frag fragmentation might have been a bad example to use. The, the general question is, how old is it age? Have you had it up and running under a production load for a period of time? Um, the only thing that sort of ages is the history of where the data has resided that is needed for recovery. Uh, history of the health states of the cluster, that sort of stuff that is needed. Uh, consider it like a journal in a traditional system. It, it, it is needed for recovery. The only thing that really has an age is that component. And uh, we've had bugs with that kind of growing too, too high, having a sort of um, a busy loop causing so many operations that the, the need to remember things grew huge. And then starting from the beginning and reading it through was too much work. That sort of stuff, those kinds of bugs, I hope I'm not butchering the concepts here, but those kinds of bugs have existed. But, but it's it is true when it becomes moot. Exactly. It, it so it depends on how it's really it, based on how long the cluster has been unhealthy. So if you let an uh, ailing cluster linger for a long time, then it's going to be Yeah. So it, 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 it behaves much like a journal. Once you reach a sync point, everything previous is discarded. And in that sense, we have that sort of aging. But it should be time bound by the fact that you come up to a healthy cluster and there you go. And there's also other things you can do to the cluster, like the, the cluster only thinks it's unhealthy when something goes away and it thinks it's coming back. Um, if your data center operation guys report smoke coming from the server, you can tell Seth it's not coming back. <laughs> and then your cluster's healthy again. After a short interval. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Every balancing. So I've got maybe an interesting use case and then um, based on time, probably wrap the conversation up. Okay. So you, you tell me if this is an interesting uh, challenge. Uh, let's say that you've got, either in the scientific world or the media world, you've got a big file, and it's probably a terabyte in size. Mm -hmm. And I want to either put that into Ceph or get that out of Ceph as fast as possible. That's a really typical HPC workload. So which methodology would I want to use to do that, and how fast might I be able to in an ideal world, you'd use the set file system. Okay. We don't yet live in an ideal world. Okay. <laughs> I've seen Jetsons, we will. <laughs> <laughs> so right now, if you're willing to hand code your things, you're going to be using the libraries and essentially striping your big file across multiple objects. And you can access those objects independently. So if you're reading, um, when you, when, you, when you want to recover the file quickly, you're not reading it from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You're going to read it in parallel. Right. And as long as the, uh, the data is spread over multiple objects, you will be reading in parallel from the whole cluster. So you have the full aggregate bandwidth of all of the disks and all of the networking where your data ended up being distributed. Yeah, how fast to the you. Yes. So the answer to your question. Yeah. Okay. Now, in an ideal world, the file system will do that for you. Okay. So if you have a hundred or a thousand or a million processors or threads or whatever reading at different offsets of the file, well, the file is chunked into objects and each read from a different op uh, offset. If it hits a different object from a different offset of the file, each read tends to hit a different uh, object. Which so means it's it's reading independently of the rest. Okay. Yeah. So the RPD doesn't do that. Yes, it does. Okay. Yeah. So why is RPD not a good candidate for that kind of? Um, it's it? just RPD is a single consumer kind of a thing. So typically, you you have one RPD block device used by a host or a single VM. So you can have parallelism within that box but it's bound by that single box. It doesn't get into the millions. So it's not as interesting. Whereas when you're talking about the HPC world, you have a supercomputer 
that wants to, oh, we just caught the, uh, the Higgs boson. I want to write down all this data. And they literally freeze the computation until they've written it all down. So they want to write in parallel, like hugely in parallel. And it's OK, as long as each offset of the file goes to a different, uh, different object, you can write to all of them in parallel <coughs> without stepping on anyone's toes. You, you could do something like use libRBD, but then you run into all the problems that Seth is trying to solve of, OK, now you've got a whole bunch of things that you're trying to write, a whole bunch of large files, each of them is its own uh, RBD device, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, container is probably a better word. Each of those own container. You have to keep an index of those containers um, so that you can look them up and know which one to read from and which one to write from. And yeah, it's, if, you, it's, if you're going through you're that, that if you're going through that level of effort, you might as well use libraries. Okay. Like it's not saving you that much at that point. Uh, the, the one thing I wanted to say is that there are crazy people who run RBD with the caching turned off and then run a cluster file system on top of that. Oh my God. So they have multiple machines accessing the same RBD image, and then they run a cluster file system on top of that. Which, once again, in an ideal world, you would not do this. But there you go. And that's what is the difference between a cluster file system. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's 8.30, and that was a great ending. TV, thank you very much for this presentation. A lot of information. Sage, thank you for weighing in. And uh, I'm just going to open this up to any uh, final questions about the meetup or what you would like to see at the next one. What geographic area does Mass cover? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so the first Mass was last month and it was in Santa Monica. And the intent was to go from Santa Monica to Burbank and back and forth. Uh, and Ink Tank kindly donated this facility, thank you very much, which was centrally located. Um, so that kind of worked. But the intent is uh, Mess LA will encompass from Santa Monica to Burbank and everything in between. Um, there is also a mess in the Bay Area, and we're looking to do one in San Diego. let you know about the San Diego one. The Mass Bay Area met last time. Do you have contacts for the Mass in San It's on meetup.com. So jump on and hopefully you'll see a Mass SP in another one. If you look. Uh, and again, we invite people to join through meetup.com. It's just a great, easy mechanism to contact everybody and keep things straight. All right, are we good? Um, so if you have comments uh, and they're positive, put them on meetup.com. If they're negative, put them on y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they go on under. Um, and then the other comment is if you have ideas, please send them to myself or Denise uh, or just post them on meetup.com. And we'll, we'll, we've collected about 35 different topics now that people are interested in, so we're going to start trying to seed those up and find the right ones to go through the rest of the year with. Again, TV, thank you, and to Dreamhost and Inkang, thank you very much.